Uh, Sandy Davidson here, uh, a uh, highly regarded professor of journalism uh, at the university, um, is also a member of MOCLA's uh, board of directors. And, and both of us have been asked to speak today on the topic of uh, the line between peaceful protest and civil disobedience. Uh, if you participate in an action, what are your rights if the police are called? And often they show up uncalled, uh, I'll tell you. Uh, you can join us experts in a discussion and gain a better understanding of individual and organization's rights when speaking out. So Sandy's going to kick this off with a discussion of a couple of cases. All the cases, you know, the answer to where's the line drawn, what can you do, what can you not do, is basically decided by our courts. So we thought the best way to at least introduce you all to this topic would be to discuss some cases on this topic. And all of the cases we're talking about have ties to this campus, to this community. And, and one of the most famous cases on students' First Amendment rights is, is Tinker versus Des Moines Board of Education. And, and Sandy's going to talk about that as well as another textbook case, the Papish case. Yes, thank you. I'm going to begin by showing this. What if you had a student who said, I'm really into botany, and showed up in a t-shirt like this? Well, I think it's kind of interesting. The Supreme Court, in a case called Bong Hits for Jesus, right. uh, yes, <laughs> says basically, if you are promoting illegal drug use, you got a problem, you can be disciplined. If you're making a political statement, you're okay. So let's talk about political statements and we'll be doing a case that, for my money, if you want to get quotable language on the kind of respect that students need, you go to Tinker versus Des Moines Independent Community School District. We'll just call it the Tinker case. Back to 1969. This is, that's when this case was decided. 1969, what is going on in the United States during this time period? Vietnam. Vietnam. Vietnam War. And if you wanted to protest, but you wanted to protest silently, what was the symbolic speech that you engaged in? <coughs> Black armband. Black armbands. So, in Des Moines, we have five students who show up with their black armbands. Now, I hope this isn't too scary for you all. Mary Beth Tinker, I just call her Scary Mary. Here's a picture of her. Is this a scary looking kid? I don't think so. But the school was so concerned about these five students who were wearing their black armbands that these <laughs> students were basically suspended. Now, Mary Beth Tinker, I'll just say right now, the Missouri connection, Mary Beth Tinker and her family ended up moving to Fayette, Missouri. And there have been some very interesting articles about them. You see, Mary? Beth Tinker's mom there, here she is, speaking her mind. And there was also another wonderful story just uh, last semester about John Tinker. So think of them as locals now, but what happened to them way back when? Well, when they were kicked out of school, they did not take it lying down. Their case ends up in front of the Supreme Court, and the Tinkers are winners, as they should have been. The language in this case is beautiful, I think. Uh, and I'm just going to quote some. The Supreme Court said, it can hardly be argued that either students or teachers shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech or expression at the schoolhouse gate. No, you still have rights, thank you. The officials, according to the Supreme Court, were basically acting out of fear. There was no disruption. There was fear of disruption. And the court says that isn't good enough. Again, I like the language. In our system, undifferentiated fear or apprehension of disturbance is not enough to overcome the right to freedom of expression. The court continues. 
any departure from absolute regimentation may cause trouble. We don't want regimentation, is basically what the court is saying. Now, powerful language again. The court says, in our system, state-operated schools may not be enclaves of totalitarianism. I love that line. <laughs> Students in school as well as out of school are persons under our Constitution. Isn't that good to know? Students are persons, yes. <laughs> they are possessed of fundamental rights, which the state must respect. And then this classic statement from Tinker. Freedom of expression would not truly exist if the right could be expressed only in an area that a benevolent government has provided as a safe haven for crackpots. No, we crackpots can pretty much speak our minds, including in school. So, we get a test from Tinker. And this is the bottom line in the case. The Supreme Court says a student, whether in the classroom or in the cafeteria, on the playing field, or anywhere else <coughs> on campus, quote, may express his, I'd add, or her, opinions even on controversial subjects like the conflict in Vietnam, if he, I'd add, or she, does so without doing one of the following two things. First, <laughs> materially and substantially interfering with the requirements of appropriate discipline in the operation of the school, and second, without colliding with the rights of others. So bottom line, as long as the speech is not going to cause disruption in the classrooms, it's, got, it's not going to interfere with discipline, and it's not going to collide with other students' rights, students can engage in that expression. Well, let's turn to the University of Missouri campus. This is the case that is near and dear to me, the Pate Push case. She was a student, uh, more or less, maybe less, uh, at the School of Journalism, but we'll get there. This is a six to three decision, and I always tell my students that the academic performance of Barbara Papish really should not be emulated. Uh, she was on academic probation because she just wasn't progressing in her graduate program in journalism. She had been a graduate student for five and a half years, and then she was expelled. The semester before she was expelled, I think it's kind of interesting, she had enrolled in one class, Ceramics three. <laughs> uh, the semester she was expelled, she enrolled in two classes. One was Ceramics two. <laughs> And uh, the other one was a one-hour class in research journalism. I always say that I think maybe she was worried at that point that we would, you know, be done with all our trees. We would have chopped them down. We'd have to go back to clay tablets, and she was going to be ready. That's the only thing I can figure out. But that's basically what she was majoring, if you want to call it that, uh, what she was majoring in on campus was free speech and trying to do something about the Vietnam War. So again, the time period makes a difference. This case is decided in 1973. Well, she was on disciplinary probation, and here is what she had done. She was handing out SDS leaflets. Anybody in here? SDS. Democrats. Yeah, Students for a Democratic Society. That was an organization that was popular on a lot of campuses. It was an October weekend when Barbara Papish uh, decided to pass out leaflets over at Memorial Union. Everybody knows where that is, I trust. That was a weekend that the University of Missouri had invited parents to bring their high school students to visit the campus. So we've got a conflict started. And excuse the language, but as long as something is not for broadcast, you don't have to worry about FCC and decency rules. That's part of what I teach. So I'm just going to, the leaflets that she was passing out, uh, had language, one said fuck, one said bullshit, another one had a picture of two rats copulating on the cover, 
Justice Rehnquist, in his decision, said that the rats were fornicating, but I thought that uh, really added to the moral dimension to rat behavior that was not quite applicable. Okay. All right. Um, what got her expelled? Oh, my. The Free Press Underground. One of the Free Press Underground pieces had on its cover a political cartoon of policemen and they were raping the Statue of Justice and the, uh, the Statue of Liberty, excuse me, and the Goddess of Justice. And the caption said, with liberty and justice for all. And then the newspaper also had an article about a member of an organization, I don't think it's around anymore, but the organization was called Up Against the Wall Motherfucker. And this, uh, student had been tried, he had been acquitted, so that case that happened in New York, the headline simply said, motherfucker acquitted. <laughs> Remember, it's parents weekend. Oh my. Now, the university business office, by the way, had authorized sale of the free press underground, and I don't think they quite realized what all would be in it. Okay, Barbara got a hearing in front of the Student Conduct Committee, and the committee found that she had violated a section of the general standards of student conduct. Talk about general standards. The standards required students, and I'll just quote it, to observe generally accepted standards of conduct and specifically prohibited indecent conduct or speech. So now we know exactly what we can't do, right? Mm. Before she was uh, dismissed, she had appealed to the chancellor and the board of curators and everybody said, out. So she brought a 1983 action. We're talking about an action where anybody who thinks a state actor has violated their rights, their constitutional rights, can sue for it. So she sued, she started out in federal district court in Kansas City. Now, remember, it's 42, Title 42 of the United States Code, Section 1983, if you think your rights are being violated. Papers wanted a declaratory judgment. What is that? That's a statement of the rights and responsibilities of both parties to an action. What are my rights and responsibilities, she wanted to know, and the universities. And she wanted an injunction. She wanted to be reinstated. Now, she lost at the trial level. She lost at the Court of Appeals level. But she won at the Supreme Court level, and that's all that counts, right? All right. The Supreme Court instructed the University of Missouri that it did have to reinstate her as graduate student unless there were valid academic reasons for her being expelled. And here's what the court said. And this is the bottom line in this case, the holding of it. The mere dissemination of ideas, no matter how offensive to good taste, on a state university campus may not be shut off in the name alone of conventions of decency. Let's parse that again. Mere dissemination of ideas, no matter how offensive to good taste. No, the First Amendment is not designed to protect the pretty speech that everybody agrees with. That doesn't need protection. It's designed to protect, if you want, kind of fringe speech <laughs> such as hers. All right. On a state university campus, if it's a state campus, then you can talk 1983 actions. If it's a private university or college, basically as long as no criminal laws are being violated, you know, you can have a lot of restrictions. Again, may not be shut off in the name alone of conventions of decency. Now, neither the political cartoon, the court said, nor the story constituted obscenity. They weren't constitutionally obscene, the court
court said, or otherwise unprotected. Maybe offensive, yes, but not that. The dissent disagreed. Dissenters did think that these publications were obscene. By the way, 1973 is the same year that finally the Supreme Court came up with a good decision on obscenity to give us some good definitions, but we won't spend time on that. Okay, papers, according to the court, was dismissed because of the disapproved content of the newspaper. Content. If there is content discrimination, a state agency has a problem. Now, you can have reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions, but the court said that's not what this was about. It was content. Well, Rehnquist pointed out that state universities are supported by taxpayers. I'd say now maybe more or less, maybe sometimes <laughs> less. But he said, and I'll just quote him, a wooden insistence on equating the authority of the state to criminally punish with its authority to exercise even a modicum of control over the university which it operates serves neither the Constitution nor public education well. There was concern by Rehnquist that if you had this kind of activity going on on state campuses, that there would be a lessening of support. We're talking about a pocket push book issue. Well, let's fast forward. The year is 2012. <laughs> Has anybody in here worked for the Maneater? Okay, everybody knows what the Maneater is, the student publication published by students. Now we do have a student public, uh, publication committee. I'm part of that. We're supposed to be just kind of a resource for them. But there's a, a tradition, or there was a tradition, for an April Fool's issue. And the editor was not involved. It was the underlings who had produced this issue and surprised the editor. <laughs> Surprise, here came the carpet eater. <laughs> <laughs> Squatters take the, squ the quad. Oh my. Was the university upset? Yes. And the university wanted to expel the students who were the perpetrators, including the poor editor who didn't have anything to do with the publication. At which point, the university got a little bit of pushback, and I will admit that I did some pushback, and I think my editorial is available for you online as part of the resources for this. The university had already been through this and lost the Papish case, but how short memories <laughs> seem to be. You know, the student conduct standards had to be overhauled because they had been so vague. So yes, just kind of a reminder to the university, the Supreme Court has spoken. And I'll just make a little addendum on the Papish case. There was kind of a companion case, if you want, same year, well, actually 72. Healy versus James is the name of the case. It's a freedom of association case, and it involves students for a democratic society. Remember, the First Amendment grants not only the right to freedom of expression, but also the right to association, the right to peaceably assemble. Students for a, a democratic society wanted to be recognized as a group at a public institution in, in Connecticut. And here's what the Supreme Court pointed out. It said, quote, the wide latitude accorded by the Constitution to the freedoms of expression and association is not without its cost in terms of the risk to the maintenance of civility and an ordered society, that's the court's language, but the bottom line, freedom of association goes right along, hand to hand, in hand, on campuses with freedom of expression. I'm going to stop here and turn it over to Dan. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. You know, the cases we're talking about here today, 
are about civics, they are about citizen activism, but they're also about, I think fundamentally, the effort by the government, by the establishment, to enforce conformity and to suppress controversy. And university administrators, it seems to me, in my uh, almost 50 years of dealing with them now, uh, they loathe controversy and they praise conformity. And so when students become nonconformist and they do things that are controversial, that sets administrators on edge. They just aren't comfortable with that. You know, it's been, I think it will be 50 years since the Papish case arose, and I hope we'll see some, some coverage of that case. It's such, a, it's such an amazing case, such a wonderful case. Um, and, and, and as Sandy pointed out, the university has to learn these lessons over and over and over. They don't seem to have any institutional memory. I mean, students have more institutional memory than administrators seem to. Those administrators, they come and go, you know, they're here for a few years and we never see them again. Uh, I think literally in some cases, they're not aware of the history uh, of their own institution in many cases. Um, I, I came here in the fall of 69, so I'm approaching my 50th year in this community and, and, and around this campus. Um, and so I had the chance to be uh, involved directly with a case that also went to the 8th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court denied uh, further review to it. Um, and it is literally a textbook case. When I, when I uh, uh, started law school here at MU and studied constitutional law, I was just thrilled to see this case in the textbook. I mean, literally, a textbook case on First Amendment rights because I had the chance to play a small role in the evolution of this case. But when I first came to MU, uh, there was certainly no gay rights organization here. And the university was not going to put up with any such thing. It amazes me now, today, how they embrace and, and uh, celebrate diversity, but they sure as hell did not celebrate diversity of sexual orientation back in uh, the early 1970s. In fact, they did their best to suppress it. And there were many uh, activists who, who deserve a lot of credit here, but Larry Eggleston was a, a friend of mine and uh, a man who uh, single-handedly just stuck his neck out and, and he was fearless. He, he was an amazing man. I really uh, am happy that I knew Larry Eggleston. And Larry was one of the uh, plaintiffs uh, in the case uh, that uh, decided this issue right here on this campus and decided it for many other campuses throughout the nation, certainly throughout the, the Midwest where the 8th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals rules. Uh, according to, according to the, the official uh, uh, record, uh, Gay Lib and Lawrence Eggleston individually and as an employee of the University of Missouri, I'm not sure what, how he was employed here, uh, and as a member of the executive board of Gay Lib, various other individuals, um, sued the University of Missouri. Sarah McNamara was one of them. She's a friend of mine, uh, and I remember her very, she was head of the Association of Women Students, I think is still active on this campus. Um, they sued the university, Bryce Ratchford, the university president at that time, and each of the individual members of the board of curators, because uh, the university in 1971 had declined to recognize an organization called Gay Liberation. Now many of the press accounts at that time referred to this group as Gay Liberation mm -hmm. Front, but I, I don't know why they felt like they had to add front onto the name. It sounded more militaristic, it sounded more threatening, I think, but the group was called Gay Liberation. And the appellants uh, challenged the judgment of the U.S. District Court for Western District of Missouri, in other words, the Federal District Court in Kansas City, had upheld the university's denial of official recognition to this group. Now the process then and now, I believe, for a student group, and there are hundreds of recognized student organizations on the MU campus, um, the process is that those groups have to go through certain steps, jump through certain hoops, submit uh, uh, bylaws, submit a list of officers and members, um, and apply to the student government, the student association. The Missouri Students Association um, has a committee, the Missouri Student Association Senate has a committee called the Rules Committee, which at that time uh, considered these applications, made recommendations to the, the full Senate. I chaired the Rules Committee, and I also had the opportunity to make the motion in the Student Senate that gay liberation be recognized. And there were certainly 
a, a heated debate in the student senate about that, but a solid majority uh, that voted in favor of recognizing gay lib. We took the position that the university can recognize or not recognize whoever it wishes, but if the student association recognizes an organization, it is by God recognized. And so we set about, and it wasn't my idea, I don't want to take too much credit here, but I was really happy to be part of, of giving this organization access to student funds and giving this organization access to student facilities at the university in the name of MSA. But of course we weren't satisfied with that, neither were they. Um, and so the, um, the denial of, the, of official university recognition uh, of gay liberation first had to go through, and, and I think in all 1983 cases, all civil rights cases, you have to exhaust the administrative processes first. You can't go straight to court. You have to first appeal within the institution. So uh, there was a student uh, faculty committee called SOGA, Student Organizations and Government and something else, uh, and I served on that committee while this appeal went through that committee. And the dean of students at that time, really not such a bad guy, uh, Ed Hutchison, uh, but he was caught, maybe I'm being too kind, but he was caught in pressures, you know? I mean, this is also about controversy, conformity, and money, you know, and probably most of all, money. Uh, and, and that's what the Rehnquist was right. That's exactly what university administrators cared about more than anything else. And, and I don't mean to be cynical, too cynical, I guess, in that uh, assessment. But um, they feared that the state legislature would cut funding if they allowed controversial activities on the campus. And certainly allowing a, a, a group which was dedicated to the rights uh, of gay people, uh, that couldn't be tolerated. At least the administrators didn't want to be the ones to take the heat for it. So poor old Ed Hutchison got his marching orders from above, I'm sure, and uh, he vetoed the decision of the student faculty committee, which again rec recognized and recommended that the university grant recognition to gay lib. And so after the, uh, after the internal uh, avenues of appeal were exhausted, the organization did go to court. The Western District um, in Kansas City uh, supported the university's decision. Uh, the 8th U.S. Circuit, I think, did like, no, the 8th U.S. Circuit reversed. Now that's remarkable because the 8th Circuit, I think, is, convinced, is, is generally, by conventional wisdom, considered one of the more conservative of the federal appellate district courts. You know, the federal appellate district courts are the next level below the U.S. Supreme Court. And if a case originates in a federal court, we have one down in Jeff City, we have basically two federal mm -hmm. jurisdictions, Eastern and Western here in Missouri. Each of them have three or four sub-districts within them. But if a case originates in one of the federal district courts, you can appeal to, in our case, the 8th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals based in St. Louis, which includes, I think, eight states in its jurisdiction. Um, and so that's what was done here. And bless their hearts, the 8th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals reversed the Western District of Missouri. And they, again, they cite the, uh, the history of the case and they ruled that basically the First Amendment right of freedom of association does include the right of people to, to associate for the purpose, not of fornicating, not of spreading sodomy, although that's exactly what the university claimed they were afraid of. The university over and over, and their attorneys argued that we can't condone sodomy, it's against the law. So, uh, you know, that was their argument, that this organization was dedicated to breaking the law, but they weren't. They were dedicated to changing the law, a very different and simple to grasp concept. And I think the university, and I think its lawyers, understood that concept. They just pretended not to. They just didn't want to uh, acknowledge that they understood darn well the difference between breaking the law and organizing to change the law. And that's what we're all about here today, I think to a large degree, is organizing to change the law. And I can tell you, I was very sensitive to this not only because I had gay friends and was always sympathetic to gay people's rights, but because I, uh, an issue which is near and dear to my heart is changing the drug laws, changing the marijuana laws in particular. And exactly the same argument has been made by universities to the recognition of chapters of normal uh, National Organization for Reform of Marijuana Laws and other similar and allied organizations, one called Students for Sensible Drug Policy, which has a chapter or had a chapter here on this campus. If the gay lib organization, if the gay lib decision had been sustained by the courts, um, if that principle, if you can even dignify it with that term, uh, had been upheld, then then the university could stop any organization that organized for the purpose of changing the laws. 
And I, so I think it was very important, not only for the rights of gay people and transgender and bisexual, uh, but, but for the rights of anyone who wants to organize for the most fundamental First Amendment purpose, changing the laws. And, and uh, you know, this is, this is a great, uh, this is a great decision. Uh, one of the, uh, the comments by the court said that this approach smacks of penalizing persons for their status rather than for their conduct, which is constitutionally impermissible, of course. So the gay liberation controversy uh, was a very important decision uh, and, and one that originated on this campus. And you, you know, the campus has a, a history, our, our university administrators have a history of being uh, overturned by the courts. And, and I, I think they like that, you know, in private, I think they, they like that because they say, we can say, we didn't do this, it was those darn liberal courts, those darn liberal judges made us do this. And so, you know, in the meantime, it's fun for the people, in a kind of a twisted way, you know, but you're all people who share that genetic uh, abnormality, you're all people who go to meetings and, and associate with your fellow citizens and try to change the laws and try to, try to improve our environment. And that's exactly what this is about, it's not a small thing. It's not a small thing in, in the least. Well, I was also really uh, lucky to be part of, uh, to be part of a, uh, an effort that came about in the early 1980s. I, uh, I left school, I won't say graduated, but left school uh, in, in 1973 or four, uh, and then somewhere along the way managed to graduate, uh, and about 10 years later went back to law school here. And uh, at that time, the, uh, the uh, controversy uh, du jour was, uh, was uh, divestment from American companies doing business with South Africa. And uh, all you are uh, certainly familiar with the concept of apartheid, the fact that the South African government, you know, as, as late as the 1980s continued to engage in an open and, and apparently, you know, just shameless policy of discrimination against native Africans uh, in South Africa, uh, denying them the right to citizenship, denying them all kinds of rights, on the basis of race, unapologetically. Uh, as early as at least the early 1960s, the United Nations had passed resolutions condemning this practice, of course, and any civilized uh, entity or uh, government uh, would condemn uh, this practice and policy. If South Africa must have known, the, the white minority must have known its days were, were limited. But the controversy over this practice and policy really came to a head in, in this country, and I think around the world, in the early 1980s. And one of the means of protest that was employed, certainly not first at this campus, but on this campus and many others across the country, was the construction of shanties. Uh, black people in South Africa were uh, segregated into shanty towns, and so uh, building a little shanty in a prominent public place became a uh, common method of protesting against an institution, whether it be a university or a city or any other entity which has investments in stocks, basically. Stocks in companies that were propping up apartheid in South Africa. Now, Coca-Cola didn't see itself that way. They just thought of themselves as doing their fiduciary duty to their stockholders. You know, all, all company uh, executives and boards of directors think that they're one and only obligation in life is to make more money, not for themselves, but for their stockholders. And so that's their rationalization for engaging any kind of immoral uh, conduct, uh, and in this case, uh, for propping up the apartheid government in South Africa. So Americans, American students in particular, began to focus on this approach, saying that any institution, certainly any institution of higher learning that wants to claim that it, that it is uh, promoting uh, equality and fairness and diversity certainly should not be investing in a company that's propping up apartheid in South Africa. And I think that concept was a little hard for a lot of people to grasp for quite a while, but it, you know, they, they grasped it and uh, the university of course resisted divesting from these companies. They had about $100 million in investments in companies that did business with South Africa. So, in, again in the early 80s, uh, students uh, began to um, erect shanties on the university quadrangle between the columns and Jesse Hall. The chancellor's office, at least at that time, and I think still, is right there on the uh, north side uh, to the left 
of center of the uh, of of the, uh, the the north end of Jesse Hall, and so the chancellor every morning would come into his office and he would see these shanties uh, on the quadrangle. And uh, I remember I was uh, I was in my last year at law school, in fact, my last semester, uh, uh, hanging around campus. I just couldn't bear to leave, and uh, got out of class one afternoon. I walk over to the quad. And I was a part of this group. Uh, uh, and I see my friends being led off. 41 students were being led off by university police to a school bus, if I recall correctly, and they were going to be hauled down to the Boone County Jail. Now, the chancellor, this is a concept that I, I find interesting and I think is not widely uh, remarked upon. Um, the chancellor has an armed police force at his beck and call. The University of Missouri police answer to the chancellor. If the chancellor says, arrest that person, that person will be arrested. Now, I don't think the mayor of Columbia has that authority. I don't think that our police department would even listen to the mayor if he said, go arrest these guys, you know? They might arrest them if they believe they're committing a crime. But the mayor, the council, we have a councilman's wife right here. Uh, I don't think the councilman would tell the police department, go arrest these guys for protesting or for anything else in particular, you know, and, and expect the police to just do their bidding. But by God, the University of Missouri police, they do the bidding of the chancellor. When the chancellor said, arrest those cretins out there on the quadrangle, they did. And they, they did not check with the Boone County Jail. Now at that time, the Boone County Jail was not the modern, luxurious facility we have up on Roger Wilson Drive today. No, it was a true dungeon. I mean, that's a very literal description. It was a dungeon. Uh, tacked onto the back of the Boone County Courthouse, and and it was it was it was horrible. It was just a terrible medieval little dungeon, and it was small. And they didn't check and say, by the way, do you have 42 vacant beds at the Boone County 41 uh, at the Boone County Jail? And by failing to get a reservation in advance, like many of us, they found there was no room at the end. So they take these 41 students up to the jail, and the jail says, the hell do you want us to do with these? Kids, you know, we're gonna put these guys in jail and let out the murderers and the rapists. And uh, so, you know, I, I'm not even a lawyer yet at that point, but I end up talking on the phone with Judge Larry Bryson. And Judge Bryson understands the dynamics here. He knows they don't have room for these people in jail. Uh, what do you do when you arrest people but there's no room in the jail? Well, you yeah, gotta let them go. And so I find myself negotiating. I said, Judge, I'm not a lawyer. First off, you understand, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not practicing law without a license here, but I'll be glad to talk to you about this situation. He says, well, if they'll just agree to obey all the university rules, I'll, I'll let them out. And I said, Judge, that's just that's, that's the issue here. They don't, they're not going to agree to obey all the university rules. He says, all right, I'll let them out anyway. <laughs> so, uh, he does. But some of those students refused to go. He said, we're taking this jail cell hostage. And Carlo Weitzel, Carlo Weitzel in particular, was just a real hell raiser. I, I really admire Carla. Uh, and, and she did take a jail cell hostage for weeks. She went on a hunger strike and uh, continued to get more publicity for this issue by doing that. And um, so I'm, you know, I'm playing lawyer at that point. And Gary Oxenhandler, who many years later became circuit judge here, and became presiding circuit judge here. But at that time, was just a practicing lawyer. Um, Gary agreed, we went to him, and we knew he was a good guy, and he agreed that he would, he would uh, uh, that I could help him, rather, defend these 41 people on trespassing charge, trespassing on the quadrangle. That crime had never occurred in 150 years of university history, but by God, these people were trespassing on the quadrangle. And so uh, we go up to see Joe Mosley, was then the county prosecutor. And Joe's just the nicest guy you ever meet. Everybody likes Joe. And so, you know, we had a very pleasant talk with Joe Mosley. He says, well, guys, what do you want to do about this? <laughs> I think Gary came up with the idea, it was brilliant, of saying, well, Joe, why don't you just dismiss 40 of these cases? We'll pick one guinea pig for a, a, a defendant, and he or she can go to trial, and we'll let the judge figure out whether uh, the students are right or not. And so I, I did choose our guinea pig, which was Catherine Benson. And I chose Catherine because I knew she was very articulate, very smart, very reasonable. Uh, she had deep ties to this community. She grew up here in Columbia. Her father's on the faculty at MU. Uh, she seemed like the perfect guinea pig, and she was willing. She was willing. Uh, and so uh, she was our test subject. And so we won 40 out of 41 cases just like that. So whether we could win the 41st one uh, was the question. Well, they assigned a judge 
uh, who no one seemed to know much about here, Patrick Horner of Callaway County. Of Fulton. Uh, none of the Boone County judges wanted to be the judge on this case. So they got good old Judge Horner to come over and, and uh, sit on this case. And, and we decided that we would essentially, there really wasn't a trial as such because there was no disagreement about what the facts are. Both sides agreed what the facts were. The question is, what is the law? Can you be arrested and prosecuted successfully, convicted that is, for trespassing on the quadrangle if you're there for a clearly a political purpose is, of course, how we would put it. I mean, if, you know, if you're out there tearing up the grass or something, of course the university can tell you to leave, and if you don't, maybe that's a trespass. We concede that. But that wasn't the question here. The Shanty Towns weren't accused of, of destroying the grass or committing, uh, committing uh, vandalism. They were accused of political expression. And so good old Judge Horner, the conservative Republican that he is, had no problem seeing that the First Amendment did indeed protect the rights of those protesters. And Catherine Benson was found not guilty, and, and we won. Well, that was the first Shantytown case. The second Shantytown case grew directly out of this incident because at that time, when anybody was arrested, not only in Boone County, but across the 114 counties in the city of St. Louis, if you were going to be in jail for any length of time, you were subjected to a strip search. You were subjected to a body cavity search if you were accused of a misdemeanor and you didn't bond out right away. Now that gave a great incentive to bond out, of course, but aside from that, it seemed uh, distasteful. Um, turned out that it was illegal. Turned out that it was clearly illegal. If you can read English, it's right there in the Missouri statutes, only because another court had, had issued a similar ruling, that thou shalt not commit a strip search or a body cavity search on a person charged with a misdemeanor unless you've got a specific reason to believe they're hiding evidence, you know, dope or something like that, or a weapon. Well, they had no reason to believe either of those things about the students up there. Now, most of them did sign uh, you know, uh, promised to come back to court and left the, left the jail. They didn't promise to obey the rules, they just promised to come to court. Um, twelve, if I remember, there were twelve students who stayed in jail at least one night, and they all were subjected to the body cavity strip search. And we got the ACLU involved, and uh, Frank Sussman was the lawyer uh, this time. Uh, I just had the good luck to work with really good lawyers. And so I worked with Frank Sussman. Frank had argued abortion cases in the U.S. Supreme Court. He was uh, first-rate lawyer. As far as I know, he still is. I hope he's still with us uh, over in St. Louis. And he, he had done a lot of ACLU work. So we uh, sued. Uh, Ted Bain was then the Boone County Sheriff. We sued the County of Boone and the Sheriff for committing these strip searches on these shantytown protesters. And that case did go to trial down in Jefferson City, in the Federal District Court in Jefferson City. And uh, Scott Wright was our judge. Now, no one here probably knows Scott Wright, but he was a legend in his time. Uh, he had been a Boone County prosecutor, and Tom Eagleton had gotten Judge Wright appointed to be a U.S. district judge. I think it, it might have been under Kennedy, maybe, maybe Carter, but under a Democratic president, uh, and, and the U.S. Congress confirmed him. And Scott Wright was just an eccentric guy. He was, he was very smart. But he was cantankerous, and he had a high-pitched, crackling voice, and he had been a World War II fighter pilot. I mean, he was a very uh, interesting guy, and uh, he was our judge. And so we go to trial down there, and I'm just loving it. I never, you know, barely been to a trial before. Um, Frank is doing the cross-examination of the sheriff, and, and right in the middle of, of Frank cross-examining Sheriff Bame, Judge Wright just picks up the gavel and bangs it down and says, all right, that's all. I don't need to hear any more from you, Sheriff. I said, you broke the law. Now, jury, you decide how much money these people are going to get. You know, just like that. Just bam, you know. I mean, that's the way it happens in the movies, but I didn't think it would happen that way in real life. But it did in Judge Wright's court. And, and uh, so, okay, so we go direct to the damages phase, you know. <laughs> and, and, and we weren't looking for a lot of money. 
I mean, you know, we would have taken a lot of money, but uh, uh, but we won the case. We won that case. I think they each got a thousand dollars, which certainly wasn't enough. But they weren't interested in the money either. Frankly, none of those kids were interested in the money. We did get quite a bit in legal fees. You know, I wasn't worth much, but Frank Sussman's time was pretty darn expensive. So we got a lot of money for the ACLU uh, in that case. But the most important thing about that case is this, and we didn't know it until the case was over with. But every sheriff in the state of Missouri was in insured by the same insurance company at that time. After that insurance company paid out not only damages but legal fees uh, to the ACLU over this case, they wrote a letter to every single one of those 114 and City of St. Louis sheriffs and said, if you engage in searches, body cavity or strip searches of people charged with a misdemeanor without a reason to believe they're holding evidence or weapons, we are not insuring you anymore, you're on your own. Well, that put an end to all of the searches across the state of Missouri. And I tell you, you know, it's the greatest case I've ever been a part of uh, to this day. <laughs> There's not been one that was much fun to win. And then consider what happens after that. Well, it's like in December of that same year, the Board of Curators says, you know, maybe we will just divest, you know? We're not the first university to do this. Maybe the legislature won't totally cut us off. Maybe we can actually still make just as much money on other corporations, which they could and did. And they, by God, divested. And then it was, I don't know, maybe a year or so later that the South African government crumbles and apartheid is abolished and Nelson Mandela is elected president of South Africa. Now that's the domino effect I like to see, you know? And, and <laughs> it, was, it was a direct effect of not just the MU Shan accounts, but people like the students here at MU across the nation doing the right thing and uh, <laughs> good old Jack Watry. I'm not sure that he isn't still around, but. Good old Jack Watt. You know, back in the anti-war days, the ACLU sued the university, and it turned out they were keeping files on student radicals. And, and Roy Ellinger later served in the state legislature, and my innocent self, we, it was, we were notified that we had files at the university, uh, and we were welcome to come and examine our uh, sanitized files. And you know, one of the things that came out, I mean, I'm, I'm digressing a bit here, but I think this history is important to know. The university police were surveilling the YMCA. Now the YMCA, I have to admit, was a hotbed of radical activity in those days. Uh, and what they did is they actually took the type, I don't know if you've ever seen a typewriter with a ribbon, uh, but they took the typewriter ribbons out of the trash cans and transcribed what was typed by looking at the ribbon. Can you imagine how much of our tax money they wasted transcribing typewriter ribbons from the YMCA? I mean, that's some, some crazy stuff. Well, the, the, the last case, and then I want to give you at least a few more minutes to talk. Well, I have the last time. Or maybe we should just go right to questions. The, the Wickersham case was the final case I was going to talk about. <laughs> students at, not, well, students and others at the, the Salute to Veterans Air Show wanted to wear hats and t-shirts with political messages and pass out brochures and have petitions signed and, and uh, ACLU sued and we won another good case. Marilyn Teitelbaum was the lead attorney on that case. Um, but we won again for the most part, we won that case. But yes, let's take questions uh, or, or if you have more you'd like to add. Well, I would add one thing to the Shantytown cases. In Missouri law, if you have um, a defendant who wins, then the case is deep sixed if you want to get hold of the opinion. But Horner wrote the most glorious opinion on Francis Quadrangle being a public forum. And I think that's important for us to remember. It is a public forum, open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can speak your mind there. Indeed. Yes. Yeah. So um, you say the university does it over and over. I'm thinking that part of the reason is they think that the students won't find uh, representation. Mm -hmm. you know, I see this with landlords, oh, we're going to keep your deposit because you know the students are leaving. They don't want to go on for years and years and years to the Supreme Court or whatever it takes. Mm -hmm. And so the university counts on them not doing that, finding, calling Dan Gates <laughs> or uh, putting you in touch with the ACLU or something. So because they don't have money, right. they, yeah, ACLU performs a very important role. We had a local ACLU chapter until a few years ago, and they just reorganized and did away with local chapters. But as I mentioned, Mid-Missouri Civil Liberties Association 
uh, has, has taken over that role, and we do encourage people with civil liberties issues to contact us. Yes? So, when did the 2016 Black Lives Matter protest happen down in the campus? I was here, and one of the questions was, like, were they even allowed to protest on the campus? With the Shantytown case here, because it was a political act mm -hmm. on a public space, with this, yeah. the university was in the wrong. Well, absolutely. We have public forums all over the place in, in this university. Anytime you are on a public street, public sidewalk, you have an absolute First Amendment right to protest. Well, now I say absolute. You can have reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions. If you want to try to shut down a roadway, you may need to, to get a, a permit. But we had the speaker circle then, and there was some uh, confusion that maybe that's the only place that you can speak. The legislature passed the Campus Free Speech Act that makes clear, no, you know, uh, you have rights all over the place in this university. Now, you can't disrupt classes. Right, and you can have restrictions on tents. And again, we've had, we have a lot of case law on that, but it's not related to the free speech issues. There can be other issues, you know, safety, um, health, that kind of thing. And I guess how are tents any different than the shanties that students are building? Like well, that's, that's the question I have. Is how, how are these tents any different than the shanties that these other students were building well, in the 70s? The thing is, the shanties were not the issue in the case if it had been argued that way with on you know focusing on the shanties then maybe you would have had uh, a, a different outcome on just that notion of can you have shanties or tents there's been cases for instance uh, involving parks and even involving veterans who wanted to uh, be camped out Places. So that would fall more under the time, place, and manner restrictions. So those those kind of restrictions have been upheld. That's one thing the university has learned. What? That's one thing they've learned then is to call it something different. You know, the university now says you can't have a tent. It seems to me that the rule ought to be if it's political and not, you know, residential, that, that is protected. So, I mean, I would certainly have argued that the, oh, that the Black Lives if, Matter. If it is just put up, you know, I, I, I think you, yeah, the devil is in the details if you wanted to but have they it. were tenting there as a political actor. Okay. Right, so and overnight uh, was was part of the problem there. We've got a question. Does any of this apply to other public spaces not related to the campus? What? Does it, do any of these decisions apply to other public Oh, other than the oh, yes, yes. Absolutely. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, actually, it's kind of good. Oh, sorry to interrupt you. But that's okay. The time, place, and manner restriction. Yeah, time, place, and manner restriction. Oh, I do want to pass these out. Any place. Would you pass these down? We, we, we were supposed to talk about the rights of dealing with the police. These are your rights of dealing with the police. Rule number one, don't talk to the police. <laughs> the right to remain silent.